Hello? Hi? Okay, hi. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is our first meetup after the pandemic started. So, give me a second. One second. <laughs> So as I mentioned, this is our first meetup after a break, so of course we have some technical problems. Thank you. One, two, three. Test. We had our meetup.
Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Josh. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I'm real excited to be here remotely and for the first post-pandemic uh, lockdown meetup. Can you all see my screen? Can I get like a, a yes or a whoop or some such? Oh, I can see you now. Can I? Can someone scream out or shout out something nice from the audience so I can make sure I can hear you? Yay! Okay, cool. Thanks. Awesome. Hello. Uh, I am very excited about linting. I realize many people, perhaps some of you in the audience, don't have the same loving relationship that I do with your linter. And that's okay, because linters are a tool set that have been long misunderstood, and I think only in the last few years has the JavaScript TypeScript community really started to understand how to do linting the right way. So I'm excited to bring to you the latest and greatest things in linting TypeScript for this current year, 2023. Uh, everything that I'm going to show you is open source, including the demo. I'm going to walk through a demo that shows off a lot of the cool stuff you can do. And it's linting TypeScript in 2023. I forgot to post this on my personal site. So I'm just going to real quick, and you're going to watch me do it, post this to Twitter. That is a weird photo to have on there. Let's 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 go see something else. OK. GitHub.com slash Joshua K. Goldberg slash linting TypeScript in 2023. Sparkles. Will Twitter get the rights? Autocompletes? No, it won't. So I'll just I'll just put it here without context. Okay. There we go. So what I'm going to show you today is going to take part in four steps. First, I'm going to explain TypeScript and ESLint, how this, this whole thing works together, why you shouldn't take the linter, why you should learn to love it. I'm going to show you a demo of using the two together to show three classifications of bugs that you can rather immediately catch with linting. I'm going to show off some of the cool new stuff in TypeScript ESLint v6, which is coming out hopefully soon later this year. And I'm going to pester you all to get involved with my open source projects, such as this thing. Let's do this. So, oops, TypeScript ESLint. This is a match made in static analysis heaven is the phrasing I like to use. The difference between the two tools is subtle but important. ESLint is a tool that only looks at the raw syntax of your code. It looks at your variables, functions, whatevers, and complains to you when it detects something wrong. Like if you say, create a variable and then never use it. Or if your project naming conventions say to use one naming convention and then you actually name it in another. But ESLint only understands the raw syntax. It doesn't understand the types behind your code. It doesn't understand that some other file might export a function that only ever returns a number. So if you assign the result of calling that function in some other file to something that's supposed to be string, that might be an issue. That's the type of type issue that TypeScript understands. TypeScript understands not just the raw syntax, but also what the code is really meaning, what it is intended to do which is a very powerful, very nifty thing. So let me, oh, sorry, my uh, Zoom is taking over my slides. Okay, let me, let me play a game with you to demonstrate why that's really awesome. If you were to run just this file in JavaScript, if in fact, that's okay, it is a typical UI component in a modern library like React or Solid. Let's say that, uh, let's say that you don't have a type system. There's no way for you to know without a type system if this code is safe or if the particular usage of the code is safe. You have no idea whether the code is ever called with the right thing. Maybe it's called with no arguments, or maybe it's called with two arguments. Maybe the action argument that's meant to be called to asynchronously do some action is actually a function that doesn't return a promise, so it's wasteful to await it. Maybe it's not a function at all. Maybe it's an array of functions. There are all these different questions that we have about the code that we can't answer unless we have a full understanding of what's called the type system, the system of how different things in the code are meant to be used. And that's where type checking comes in. TypeScript parses your full project. It reads all your files, which is a little slow at times, but gives it a lot of great information. And then it provides, and this is the part I really care about, APIs for tools like TypeScript ESLint to take action on those pieces of information. So we have ESLint, which is a tool that looks at your code and scrutinizes your syntax. And now with TypeScript ESLint, we have the ability for your ESLint rules to really get powerful, to use type information to make much more informed, powerful deductions. In other words, we can level up our lint rules. 
very exciting. So in order to get started, and again, I will show a demo of this. If none of this is making sense, that's OK. If you're using ESLint, you'll have to add these two options to your ESLint configuration after installing TypeScript ESLint parser and TypeScript ESLint ESLint plugin. The parser is the piece of software that allows your ESLint code to read in TypeScript syntax. Because ESLint is built only for JavaScript, it doesn't understand non-standard extensions like TypeScript or Flow. So you need to use a parser for them. And now that you've used the parser to enable ESLint to understand your code, uh, you have to actually do something with that. So we provide a lot of rules in the TypeScript ESLint, ESLint plugin that work on TypeScript specific things. Everything from uh, naming conventions for TypeScript constructs to detecting asynchronous issues using type information. Now I will note this second line here, plugins, this doesn't enable any of those rules. It just makes those rules available to your ESLint configuration. So in order to enable some rules, we recommend the following two lines of, well, three lines of configuration really. Extends, which is an array, and then two options to extend from. One is the list of recommended rules by ESLint, rules that the ESLint team thinks are necessary and good for most projects. And then the TypeScript ESLint recommended rules, which are things that we think specific to TypeScript are good and useful for all projects. But there's one more problem here, which is that I mentioned TypeScript's type checking is slow. We don't enable type system informed rules by defaults. We have rules that act on TypeScript syntax, but understanding the types behind them is a lot slower for some projects, so we don't enable it by default. If you do want to get type information, it's a little bit more configuration. Uh, there is a recommended requiring type checking set of rules that we do provide. And in order to use them, we ask that you specify parser options dot project, which is going to tell us that you do want type system to be enabled for your rules. And the TS config, the TypeScript configuration file to do so is that one. Let's say dot slash TS config dot JSON. Now, this is a lot of configuration. We're going to make it simpler eventually soon. But for now, I think that's enough looking at slides and I want to break into some code. So I have this linting TypeScript in 2023 project. It's what I just tweeted out that I will put on my Fostodon eventually soon. Uh, if you don't have to fork it, if you want to use it, you can just get clone it from me. You just won't have permissions to send pull requests. You also just, you can just watch, you don't have to clone this locally, but if you do clone it locally and then run yarn and then run yarn dev, you'll get this nice little Next.js dev server on localhost, which might eventually load depending on my luck today. That's unfortunate. And I was running something else, so now it's not working. Yarn dev port 3001. Come on. There we go. OK. So this is a quick little demo. I'll show you what it's supposed to do. I'll show you how ESLint is configured. And then I'll show you some, some cool bugs that we can catch with ESLint. What it's supposed to do is let you click a button. And every time you click the button, you get a random color on the page. Uh, you get a call count incremented, and that color is actually used for the page background. That's all this demo does. And then there are a few different variants of that button. Now, the code supporting this is not super complex. There's a single page index TSX with two pieces of state. Again, if you don't use React, that's OK. Just follow along in your head. We have a piece of call count state which is a number starting at zero, and then a custom color, which starts off as undefined, and, that, and then eventually can become a string. This example action is what's called by the buttons. We create a color with three random RGB values, increment call counts, set the custom color, and that's it. And in our React code, we render the call counts in custom color, or not. All right. In order to lint this, I have done pretty much what I showed in the slides, just with a few extra pieces of configuration I'd encourage you to explore on your own. I love the TypeScript sort keys and the simple import sort plugins for ESLint. Those things enable rules that help keep your code sorted alphabetically. Simple import sort, I think, is pretty, uh, pretty well liked by the community. I think 
sorting the keys on all your TypeScript types and interfaces might be a little more controversial of an opinion, but that's okay. Then I also enable TypeScript ESLint's recommended rules for specifically only TS and TSX files, because I don't particularly need those rules enabled for JS files. And then I've disabled these three rules here only for demo purposes, because we're going to find those bugs as we go through the code. But just to show off, I will disable them now. And then in a new terminal, do yarn lint. And sorry, I said disable. I will undisable them now and then run yarn lint. And then we can see in the terminal a whole bunch of complaints from ESLint. Yay, complaints. Woo. All right. So I promised a demo. Let's look at the demo. Now, this code, this button here is code, does something called violating, violating await venable. Await venable is a TypeScript ESLint rule. And it is a rule intended to catch cases where you use the await keyword on a value that's not actually a promise. That's actually totally valid in JavaScript. If you want to play around in Node or in the browser console, you, you can do that. You can do like await async or await three. That's allowed, as well as await promise dot resolve three. But it's it's unnecessary. It's it's wasteful to do this. There's no need to await a value that isn't a promise. So that's why one of the rules we enable in TypeScript ESLint is await venable which you can find on typescript-eslint.io, which catches if you await a value that's not identable, which is the term for any JavaScript value that has a dot then method, most commonly promises. So let's look at the code. I got this await venable button, and it looks pretty reasonable to me. In fact, you might recognize it from the, the demo slides. Uh, button. We've got these props where we pass in action, which is a function that returns void, some children, which is any React node. And then we create a button that is disabled while the action is running, which is only true while the action is being called. We set running true, await action, set running false. So this actually, uh, this actually is a bug because if you'll notice, we never we never set the button disabled to true. It's always enabled. And this page is this lovely disco effect because it's always enabled. And if we use the fancy schmancy TypeScript final references feature to see where the button is called or rendered, we see that it's provided example action in index TSX, which if we go to definition on, we see this is not an async function. So, there's no actual need to await this, which we can infer also from the fact that this action returns void, not promise. And if we go back to our ESLint config and re-enable await venable, the rule, which is in one of the recommended presets I mentioned, we, I will go ahead and quick fix to remove it. And then we get a second complaint saying this async arrow function on click doesn't need to be async because it doesn't await anything. Get rid of that too. And now we can see set running true and set running false are unnecessary because action synchronously runs and then we immediately flip back to set running false. So the running state is always false. So there's no need for the running state. And there's also really no need for this on click callback, which means I have now, using the power of TypeScript ESLint, found an issue with the code. And I don't know about you, but I consider dead code to be a bug. So I would qualify this as I have found a bug using the linter. Yay. That is demo one of three. Also, just quickly switching back to the slides, I've copy and pasted the link to the rule docs and the summary of the rule docs in the slides, if that's how you prefer to learn. So for await tenable, the specific technical description is, if the await keyword is used on a value that is not a the value is directly resolved immediately. While doing so is valid JavaScript, it is often a programmer error. The second rule that I'm going to demo today is my favorite, no floating promises. A floating promise is one that is created without any code to handle any errors it might throw. 
Floating promises can cause several issues, such as improperly sequenced operations, ignored promise rejections, and more. In other words, you create a promise and then it floats off into the distance. You never actually handle its, its potential issues, which is a real common thing when you say users are new to promises and they forget and await, or they create it and then don't understand why the code isn't running synchronously. And I'm just gonna show you the no floating promises button here. It looks very similar to the await venable, but it's got the opposite problem. You click the button, and it never gets disabled. So you can just keep clicking and nothing, nothing ever stops. And if we re-enable no floating promises in our ESLint config, now we get this nice little complaints that, hey, you call to action, which does return a promise, but you didn't await it and do the call with the dot catch or dot then with a rejection handler, or in this one, Fun fact is a cool feature in JavaScript. You can mark something as void to indicate you don't care about the returned result. But I'm going to fix this by adding an await and making this function async. Oops. Await action to fix the rules complaint, which means now, voila, the button is disabled when we click it. And I know what you might be thinking. This does not seem like extremely user critical code. I promise you, I have seen real bugs in features in real production applications caused by almost exactly this issue very often. So this is quite useful. Okay, one last rule to demo. This one is a relatively new addition to TypeScript ESLint. It's called no misused promises. This rule forbids providing promises to logical locations, such as if statements in places where the TypeScript compiler allows them, but they are not handled properly. In other words, whereas before we had promises that were created but not handled, or we were handling something like a promise that didn't need to be, here it's that we are handling the promise, but we are misusing it. We are handling it wrong. And this can show up in, ooh, that was good luck, in odd and unexpected ways. In a lot of React applications are similar these days. If you, say, throw a an error or have a rejected promise in React rendering, then you get this nice little dev pop-up at dev time. In production apps, it doesn't show up, so you just get nothing. The, the button or whatever action you took doesn't work, and then there's an angry log in the console, and that's it. And this is because we are not actually handling the results of a promise rejection. Going back to a new component, no misuse promises, which is the same as what I just fixed the floating promises code to. We await the action, but finding all references and seeing where it's used, example action async, risky. This one, in addition to waiting a second, actually throws an error half the time after the second call, which you can see here. Now, error handling in any application is gonna be tricky. In theory, what you can do is something like try async action, and then maybe catch error. And then maybe you want a piece of state like const pot set pot equals use state, which might be an error. And then you can do like set pot error. And then, oh boy, error. This is actually unknown because it, we don't know what's getting thrown here. It could be an error, it could be something else. So like maybe you'll render the error here and see what happens there. So if we have a cot state, come on. Oh no, cot and JSON dot stringify cot. Maybe that'll work. See, error handling is hard, but it is important because you don't want code to crash. There we go. Ah, oh, fun fact, stringifying an error gives you nothing. So let's call it caught as any dot message. See if that fixes things. There we go. But this isn't foolproof because you still might throw an error in your catch statement. It's entirely possible that you did something like set caught fancy with logging, which is actually a function that like caught does something. 
So what I recommend for people who really want to be careful with their error handling is use some sort of function standard to your application like this. Run safely, which takes in an action and then something to do on error. Now, there are different patterns you might prefer, especially if you use some different framework than React, maybe if you're using Redux or Solid or whatever. But basically, all this does is call the action and then call on error safely. Or maybe you would even set on error to be like, uh, set some global error state. Who knows? It's up to you how your application actually wants to display errors to the user. Here, what we do is we just have an error state local to this button, this fixed promises button, which is error, set error. And then if the error is caught, we stringify it in this span. And just to show off ESLint, if we re enable no misuse promises and go back to our old component, we do see that it would have caught us running on click in an on click listener. And the reason why, by the way, uh, not to get too technical, the reason why this is a misuse promise is because the built in React types for on click do not understand that the stuff being passed to them might return something, say a promise. If you go to definition on on click, you get this lovely TypeScript definition saying mouse event handler of T or undefined. Don't worry about the T. Uh, mouse event handler is an event handler, which is, I'm just gonna delete half this syntax because it is convoluted, but basically it is a function that takes in an event such as a mouse event and then returns a void, which is a problem because if we provide a function that returns a promise to a handler that expects a function returning void, then the returned promise we created just floats off. It's another form of creating a floating promise. In this way, we are misusing it. So whatever you do for error handling, I definitely recommend enabling no misuse promises from TypeScript ESLint because it'll detect when you pass an async function to something that won't properly handle the errors, like in this code. And now if we go back to the demo, aha, this may fail safely, does in fact fail safely. It does allow the button to be re-enabled after it is throwing an error. Cool. That's all the demo code I wanted to show you. Next up, I'm very excited about this, is TypeScript ESLint v6, which is, I would say, the next big thing in linting TypeScript code. But I realize I'm talking about a major version bump of a linter, so you're probably not all on the edge of your seat here about this being the next big thing. It's not for sale. But there are a few links that I want to show off. I'm not going to show a demo of it because it's real early stage, but I do want to build type. Um, if you want to see the full list of changes, uh, this screenshot I took just before the presentation, so it is real fresh. I was typing this out furiously during the tech checks. Uh, we have a whole set of upgrades that are in V6 that you can take a look at. And if you do want to get started on them locally and you're already a TypeScript VSLint user, we have rc-v6 as a tag on NPM, so you can try those out. Uh, it's the same packages you were using before, TypeScript ESLint slash whatever, at rc-v6. Uh, the first big change set that I'm really excited about is we're trying to simplify and consolidate how you configure your TypeScript ESLint configs. For starters, first little sparkle here, is that the rules that you want to enable that are recommended are now uh, in cascading configs, I think is the proper term. Previously, if you wanted to enable both the non-type checked recommended rules and the type check recommended rules, you had to enable both of those presets. Now the type check one includes the non-type check ones. So you only have to enable one, it's just a little easier. However, to counteract that slight reduction in file size, we also added a new set of recommended rules called stylistic. Those have taken all these stylistic preferences out from the recommended rule sets. So if you don't agree with our style preferences, then you can just 
not enable that. Such is life. And again, this is completely documented on the blog post, and we will have a full list of upgrade strategies and suggestions when v6 is a little more stable. We also have uh, one nice little improvement here. Parser options uh, project can now be the Boolean true to indicate find the closest TS config for each file. Most projects we found just use one TS config, but in mono repos or larger projects, sometimes you have different TS configs for different areas or different packages. Project true says for each linted file, find the TS config closest to it and use that for type information. So this should improve configurations for mono repos and similar. Yay, simplification. Second, uh, we have a whole bunch of preset changes for the configs. Uh, because they're uh, slightly reworked to now, I'm just going to go to this discussion. This is 6014. Here we go. Uh, we have a whole table explaining what all the keys are of what are the changes. And then for each rule, what is the difference? For example, the rule that says if you have function overloads, that's the syntax feature we both get into today, uh, that has been moved from the recommended preset to stylistic. Same with array type, enforcing whether you use T array or array of T. So that's a that's a stylistic thing, really. So this huge table, which I'm actually going to update after the meeting today or tomorrow, is available on GitHub under discussions for type VPS lint. Another another fun change set is uh, that you can you can see a whole bunch of breaking changes in our milestone number eight around the AST. This might hurt you as users because it's a breaking change. Your code might crash. But we're really excited about them. We think that they're going to make things a lot easier for people to, to work with uh, as they write rules. And the nice thing is we are almost ready for a public, public launching here. We are a slightly more than 75% complete. The screenshot is from yesterday. So I'm really excited about it. The current tentative timeline is uh, I'm going to try to get a blog post in review this week. I'm actually going on vacation to Hawaii next week, not to brag or anything, but I really need that vacation. And then first or second week of March, when I get back, we're going to get real aggressive about trying out V6. Hopefully most or all of the breaking changes will be in by then, so users can really start trying stuff out. And that's where you come in. You, Brotzla folks, I would love to get you working on TypeSheet via Slint. At the very least, just try out the project. If you haven't reset or set up your TypeScript linting configuration, in a year or two or more, which I think is most projects, then definitely check us out. We've overhauled and revamped our docs. They're great now, I like to say. And if they're not great, file an issue. We are actively soliciting people to file issues on our documentation, on features, on bugs, on whatever you have complaints about. So please let us know. We are the most active as a maintainer team we've been in a very long time. So we really want your feedback. I will also say that if you want to contribute to us, that is definitely an option. We actively now label issues as good first issue. And if you have any questions on them, you can always ask me, ask in the issue, whatever works best for you. Uh, you don't actually know, you don't have to know ASTs or linting or whatever is to contribute to us. We have a React documentation site that is, it's just React. So if you know React and TypeScript, you can contribute. If you do want to learn more fancy stuff, if you want to learn about ASTs, abstract syntax trees, what all this linting garbage I've been talking about is, then definitely recommend. Uh, we have a playground, typescript-eslint.io slash play, where you can type in code and see the AST representation, which is how we reason about your code statically without running it on the right. And I will also say that I am very motivated to help more people contribute because it means we get more done, we get better feedback, and we get more folks working in open source. So please, I want you to contribute to TypeScript BS Lint. DM or email me or whatever works best for you. I'm on Discord, all these things. Please let me know how I can help. Going to Hawaii, and then I got kind of jealous. 
<laughs> but have fun there. And thanks a lot for joining us today. But what's more important, thank you for all your work on uh, TypeScript Slint. I think we are all in debt to you for all the contributions you do to, for, to make TypeScript ecosystem better. So thanks a lot. And please give a round of applause again for Josh. OK, so now we're going to have a few questions. Um, can you hear me well? Can you say something? Not to you, Josh. <laughs> okay. Sorry, was the Josh, not you, Josh, oh, yeah, directed yeah, yeah, at yeah. me or the audience? To, uh, to you, Josh, yeah. OK, so I have the first question for you. Um, how to introduce these new rules to existing projects with large code base with a lot of possible Slint errors? Any strategy for that? It's a great question. Um, my recommendation would be to enable it and put an inline ESLint disable with a to-do comment on every place that violates that you can't immediately fix. This is a strategy I see a lot in projects that uh, migrate to a new stricter variant of a tool, both with ESLint and TypeScript. So uh, definitely don't be afraid to disable things in line. It's better to have the rule applying in all new code rather than no code at all. And also don't forget to add a to-do comment pointing to some tracking issue like a GitHub issue or Jira ticket to make sure you don't forget to clean up all those disables. You also don't want people to look at your code, see ESLint disables and to think, oh, that's a reasonable strategy and then constantly disable new Lint complaints. That's not good. Hope okay, that awesome. Does that help? OK, awesome. Uh, we got a thumb up from the audience. So it's not a question, but there's one answer. Uh, TSS Lint is awesome. And by the way, I couldn't live without it. And I totally agree. Same for me. <laughs> and I think that's the same for a lot of people here at the audience. So let's get to more questions. Um, is there any major TypeScript code problem which is not covered by TypeScript Slint yet? If yes, what it is and why? Oh, I love this question. Two, two major things. One, neither TypeScript nor linting with TypeScript Slint will fix your architectural issues. If you have a bad architecture, and bad is a very, of course, subjective variable term, then there's really nothing we can do. So it's it's not going to, you know, help you adhere to solid principles or pure functional programming or, or whatnot on, uh, beyond just raw syntax levels. Um, so don't don't think that we're, uh, as they say, a silver bullet, a cure-all. I will also say that um, we, we don't have access to the real good TypeScript API that they use internally in TypeScript, the type assignability or type relationship API. So we can't compare types against each other. We can't say check if an as assertion is unnecessary because you're slightly less precise with the as assertion. Um, so I'd say that in the next version of TypeScript, we're really hopeful that we can tap into some more powerful APIs in conjunction with the TypeScript team. But we've been asking for this for years. So you never know. Is that what you're looking for? I'm not sure if I answered. OK, I think you did. So there's slightly related, maybe not so related, but slightly related question. Uh, do you think that some of the linting rules should become a part of the TypeScript compiler, maybe with an error on warning switch? So I won't give you my normal 20 minute answer to what is an error versus a warning. But I will say no. And in fact, I think we you should go, go the ahead. other direction. We have time. Oh, great. Um, no, I was in that case, oh. uh, no, I think it's it's tricky because people, people ask TypeScript for things that are supposed to be just errors. People don't generally like it when TypeScript gives you suggestions on things that may or may not be an issue. And TypeScript actually does that in some places. It has a no unused locals, no unused parameters set of options that finds unused stuff. I think in general, the less the less TypeScript does that uh, a linter could or should do, the better. So I'd rather we move more stuff from TypeScript to linting rather than the other way around. OK, awesome. Thank you for your answer. Uh, and I have a last question for you. Uh, the question is, 
can I disable some rules in my VS code and run them only in the CI? You can. It is doable. You can always use a different ESLint config in, uh, say, CI versus your normal one for VS code. However, I would not recommend it. It gets real annoying if you have different complaints in local dev versus CI. I would instead recommend trying to get the list of rules settled so that people aren't uh, writing a lot of code that has lint failures. In my experience, when people ask this question, sometimes, often, but not always, it's because they have a lot of lint rules that are complaining and it's it's spamming the build. So I would suggest to those people, if that's you, um, try to use ESLint disables in line as needed. Try to disable any rules that aren't actually giving you value and make sure that if rules are giving you value, you bucket aside time to, to fix the complaints from those rules. Okay, thank you. And there's actually one more question that just put up, popped up. Uh, actually, we have two more questions. I'm not sure if we have time for that, but I hope we do. Um, so regarding linting architecture, would it be possible to enforce some limitations for importing files from different modules? Yes. Um, I, there, I've done this before, actually. Um, there is a no restricted syntax rule that comes in ESLint core that lets you ban arbitrary pieces of syntax using a query language that looks a lot like CSS. It's called ES query. It lets you query on JavaScript syntax. And you can ban things like uh, any import that ends with a .css from files that aren't .tsx or, or random arbitrary things like that. You can also get really fancy with it. You can enable in a certain folder banning all imports that include some other folder's name. Um, you can also write custom rules. So you could have actual JavaScript run on each import and then use some ESLint API to complain if the import is not to your liking. There's also a really cool project called Good Code Fences, Good Fences. Uh, I'm looking at it now, TS Code Fences. That lets you put little, uh, little like JSON files in each folder, indicating uh, allow list and deny lists for those. It's called Good Fences on uh, NPM and GitHub. So yeah, there are, there are a few different options. Would recommend using them. Okay, thank you. And thanks for the Good Fences recommendation. So uh, the last question is a follow up to, to the previous one. Um, so why would you put more stuff in linting than in TypeScript itself? <laughs> goading me here um answer please <laughs> fine just the 15. um 12. what is compromise 12. uh what is a what is a warning versus an error <laughs> if if a warning is something that doesn't prevent the build then a warning is nearly useless half the time because people ignore them in my experience, you should set everything, should with quotes, set everything to error in TypeScript and ESLint because otherwise they get ignored. But then you get into the semantic differences of what should be a red squiggly versus a yellow squiggly. And that's real hard. So I think, A, it's confusing to people if TypeScript complains on things that aren't actually breaking. Uh, like, let's say that you wanted to lint in TypeScript for an interface that doesn't do anything. Well, now you have TypeScript errors during your dev cycle as you finish writing an interface's initial creation before you filled it out, which is really annoying. I would also say that a lot of people get confused about what's TypeScript versus ESLint. Like they just don't understand the differences between the tools. And it doesn't help that the tool I'm professing love for is called TypeScript ESLint. Really not good naming there. So I think having a very clear delineation of which tool does what is really good, useful, and important for the community. So I think making sure that TypeScript stays to the stuff it's really good at and ESLint tools stay to the stuff they're really good at, which is definite type mismatches in the former and likely issues or style violations in the latter, that, that's helpful for everyone to keep things separate. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Uh, that was the last question. So thanks again for joining us today and I hope you will get more contributors to TypeScript ESLint after this meetup, hopefully. Um, and thanks a lot. Now, thanks, thanks, yeah, have another round of applause. <laughs> okay, awesome. So now uh, we're moving to another open source enthusiast. 
Uh, we're gonna have Mateusz Burzyński here. You may know him as Andreas on GitHub. He is a TypeScript contributor and he helped like hundreds of repositories. So if you're using JavaScript or TypeScript, there is a huge chance that you're using his code. And he's currently working on XState, Emotion, Redux Saga, Change Sets, and probably many, many more stuff. Uh, so <laughs> welcome, Mateusz. Just join me here. Okay. Do you hear me? All right, so basically I can skip through like my two, two first slides because I uh, all, uh, uh, introduced my, myself very, uh, very good. And <clears throat> yeah, beyond the things that she mentioned, I also work at Stately, uh, which is a product built around XState that has been mentioned and it helps you to visualize your application logic. I even heard today that some of you might be using it and I encourage more of you to use it because it's great. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, let's skip that. Um, okay, so, uh, sorry, yeah, so like, <clears throat> let's go first through what a map type is, just a short recap. Basically, a map type is like a function, just at the TypeScript level, uh, and it allows you to, to map some input, so we have an object here, and it allows you to map it with this function, which we have here. Um, and it allows you to iterate for each property of a type and assign a new value to that property. It also allows you to filter stuff uh, and more, but like that's the basic functionality. It's basically a mapping function from A to B, but per each property in the given, uh, in the given type. So obviously this identity, isn't really that helpful because it just gives you back the same thing. So we have the same thing here, but we can validate that it actually like works. Uh, but we can do more interesting things with that. So we, for example, has this like artificial promisify helper that ac also like accepts uh, any given object type and allows you to uh, to grab a type from the property and remember that k is bound like it's like i in a loop. So it's bound to the current property. So we grab from T, which doesn't even have a constraint here. Uh, it grabs that, uh, that type of that property, of that K property, and does something with it. So we wrap it in a promise, and then we wrap it, let's say, as a, uh, we put it as a return type of a function. So we kind of like promiseify the result of that like primitive type or really or, or, or of whatever type that we have there. So I assigned, uh, I like map the object to, uh, to the promisified thing here. So we have a new type. I assigned that to, uh, to a variable. And now we can just verify that it works. Uh, now our bar is, is actually a function, even though it, like initially it was just a number. It is a function that returns a promise. Uh, that holds a number uh, that can resolve to a number. And we can like v verify that here using various methods, it works. So that's a short recap over mapped types themselves. So partially the idea for this talk has been um, born in my head uh, thanks to Ken C. Dodds, because he asked a question on, uh, on Twitter, uh, how one can do something like this? And he tried to use the satisfies operator, which has been added in like TypeScript 4.9, so pretty, uh, it's pretty recent and all. But unfortunately, it isn't, act it isn't actually possible with satisfies because satisfies doesn't participate in inference algorithm. It only allows you to like provide some contextual typing and stuff, but like, let's not go into that. But his question is, how to make, um, how to make a like, generic thing that would strongly type a function at each property and provide the name of that property as a, 
as an argument to that function. And one of the users uh, posted the right answer, uh, and we can go into that uh, here. So <clears throat> that's basically the same code from the, from the previous slide. So in here, we are starting to dive, diving into, um, into the whole like reverse map type idea. Because usually, I think, when most people just think about map types who, who, who work with them, is that you can transform from A to B, and in a way, this is also what happens here, but the point here is that usually you can like transform some result to some other result. So you just like transform A to B, to C, to D, whatever. In here, we actually use a map type uh, to, uh, to, to like derive the constraint. So for example, we have this T type variable here, and it doesn't have any constraint, but we can still infer something very useful at this position, and we can just like iterate over, over it here and let TypeScript to gather inferences for us when it goes through the, through the argument. So we can like see that a little more, bit more in practice in a second, but in here, uh, this is pretty, pretty the same syntax as, as previously, so we have this, this map type, we iterate over keys of T, so we, buy, uh, like we assign each key to the K, and on the right side we, um, we just put that K into the callback. So it's kind of magical, I think, because <clears throat> as I mentioned, that TypeScript try, like, doesn't, it, it, it essentially, like, in my mind, it kind of like reverse engineered that thing. Because right now, it's able to, to infer from something entirely else your, what you could put as a constraint, so uh, like as a type argument. And we can see at the bottom that it actually like inferred for T, so just, just after the satisfy object name in the, in the like triangle brackets, you have this object with A and B properties and with unknowns at, uh, as values there. So as we can see, like, it kind of filled in the blank magically, even though like, that didn't exist. And it's, it, has, it can have like, a vastly different shape than the original map type, in a way, and it's able to just reverse engineer that. So it's pretty, pretty cool. And like, we could obviously like, even put that here. Uh, like even maybe different values because they, they actually don't matter and it's still type checks, but if I would put C, then we, we can see the red squiggles because B doesn't exist in that type argument, but the magic comes in the, in the fact that TypeScript is able to kind of like just magically construct, uh, construct this object on its own so we don't have to bother with it. And this is very simple, uh, like the, the very you know, basic example of that. Uh, and I, can, I have some more. Uh, so in here, we start doing some more funky stuff. Uh, and in here, we, like the, the overall structure is still the same. We just iterate over T. We, we specify that at the val property here, we want to put whatever there is, that is as TK at that position. Again, like it's always bound to the current K, so it's, it's uh, related to the current position in the object or in a tuple and stuff like that. And then we can also like uh, provide that to a different property. Uh, so we kind of make it infer in this example, uh, it, when it comes to the usage, we can, tr we can force it to, uh, to infer for the, uh, for the A property a number, because that's what we exactly put here and we specified in the template of that mapped type uh, above uh, that, it, that this position should map to whatever we, we want to infer in TK. And then we can provide it as, a, as an argument to a different thing, so uh, like to a different property, which is a CB, and it's a callback here. And again, like it will yell at us if we do weird things or like incorrect things, because we have specified the rules behind those properties in that object. So that template thing here like defines relationships in a way within that specific like uh, object, like sub object of the overall thing. Uh, because like the T, yeah, uh, the object itself is derived from T, but, it, but this whole object like this one, is not exactly T. It's only a 
product of mapping over T to something else using that the template, and the template can go uh, with whatever you want there. And at, <clears throat> at the bottom, we can see the inference provided for that. So we can again like see that it has inferred for T kind of like way simpler type that we have uh, we have typed out there because it's just uh, just an object with a a property that is a number and a B property that is a string. And yet, a more complex thing came out of it. <clears throat> uh, so maybe let's go into more practical examples because like, yeah, that's cool, theory, whatever. Uh, but, um, but it turns out that you can actually utilize this pretty neatly as like, try to be told, like probably at the library level. But this is kind of a machinery that might be driving a lot of your libraries. Uh, so I don't know, like I find it interesting to work with this stuff. And <clears throat> in here, this, um, this like artificial Prisma-based example, actually, I was, I was chatting with their um, TS magician, uh, and we came up with this, uh, because they do have this problem that they have some kind of extensions, so basically this user here is like a schema, like it corresponds to a database schema, right? And <clears throat> And they want to allow some kind of extensions to allow people to, to like register computed fields and stuff like that. Um, so how they can do that? Sorry, I lost my cursor. Okay, oh, yeah, there is, there it is. Um, so they figure out through those map types, uh, which was like an obligation for for them, uh, that they they can utilize this technique here, and they can like relate the, the computation callback, so the, the one that, uh, that grabs some kind of an input and computes that, that computation. So for example, we can have like the family name computation here, but it also specifies its dependencies at the needs property. And they do that because thanks to that, they can like generate SQL queries so they don't have to fetch the whole user from the backend to uh, to deliver you, you this final result because it depends on specific fields from your model. So, so if only you you say uh, in through this API and all, uh, or rather like through this kind of an API, what you want from this model, then they will provide that to you, and everything can uh, can be fully type checked, so it's safe and all, and it auto syncs with everything. Um, because of, of whatever magic they have used in this, this template here. So <clears throat> in here we have, uh, yeah, like the dependencies are here in the needs property. We just pump, like put them in TK, uh, so they, be, they will be there like row at that position. Uh, and we can check it out in here. So whatever is between um, triangle brackets is the inferred thing. So we can see that last Boolean, is at the family name, and this is exactly this TK that is at the needs property of the input argument uh, of the actual like runtime runtime value there, and <clears throat> and they have this this model here, uh, the user one, and now they do an intersection. So the intersection is just combining two types, so it combines like this left side and the right side, and <clears throat> the final result has to satisfy like both sides. Uh, so if we have like an, an object with A, B, C properties and the other one with just A, and we, if we intersect them, then we would essentially end up with something that only has A because we, that's the only thing that we kind of like guarantee on both sides. So in here, this, is this actually working with like strings, unions of strings exactly? Uh, so it allows them to like filter the, uh, the thing because if, if they have uh, like all of the keys of the user on one side and they only have a subset derived from the needs, then if they intersect the, them, the common, the common set of both is just, uh, is just like the filtered result, whatever was in, in those needs uh, there. So we can verify here that you can see that, um, that the user is typed here as peak user last. So exactly what we put there so that's our like family name computation, but we can specify more. So name plus last, and that constitutes for full name. And again, we have derived that uh, that we can provide here at this position the user that has a name and the last. But the sorry, 
but the original uh, user had also an age, so we can like verify that it has been actually ignored here, and it's it's cool. Uh, another another example of this uh, would be uh, would be something that uh, that a bind all function. It's just a little helper that might you might find helpful when working, for example, with React, because if 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 an use effect you uh, you bind some callbacks to to a DOM node. Uh, and if you bind multiple of them, then you can you can you should always return like a cleanup function uh, that calls remove event listener. And if you have like a bunch of those, then maybe it's boilerplate, whatever. So this is just something that um, that puts it all together, and you can like specify in an in an array all listeners that you want, and it will produce for you that cleanup function. Uh, a single one that you can call to just like unbind all of them, which is pretty cool. Um, and it's a like you know sip, ju just a simplification uh, and then like neat uh, neat trick. Uh, but like how to derive cool like good types here. So uh, so again that that whole structure here is very like similar because it's again using uh, using this uh, this map type and. It's pretty similar to the previous one. Perhaps this is even simpler because, like, you don't have any intersections here and stuff. Uh, but the point here is that you also can use the the whole idea of map types with tuples, even though like the syntax looks kind of like object oriented. Uh, we have curly braces and stuff like that. But as long as like constraint is constrained to an array, then you can also map over elements of tuples and arrays. Uh, the only like complication is that we, we need to hint TypeScript that it should actually infer a tuple at this position, which is kind of annoying, and the syntax for this is weird. Like There are a couple of ways uh, to do it, but I find this one the easiest. You, you just like spread it here, which is uh, just how it is. You, you could also create a, a tuple constraint here, but I find that more complicated for what it is. Uh, so this way, we just force it to infer a, a tuple. So we have a two-element tuple because we passed a two-element array there, and it inferred at each for each position this like simple event type here. And thanks to that, we can provide that type as event here, which obviously in here doesn't really uh, come very helpful because it's just a string. But this presents the overall idea that uh, I have here like a demo that uh, that actually accomplishes the whole complexity of deriving the, the actual uh, event type here. So it's very much possible. It's just uh, a little bit more code, and you can I will share all of those playgrounds later, so you can play around with it. But this part is a little bit more complicated. We just focus on on mapping things, and I can't move. I can click. Okay, well, okay. it works. Uh, and the cool thing is also <coughs> that uh, that I actually constrained the the types that that are going to be derived from the types of the uh, from like the event types of the target, which in in here is just HTML button element. And thanks to that, I also have autocompletes. So it's it it can create like a very good user experience. <coughs> but yeah, like that's that's a juicy stuff for me because I work on XState and stately. Uh, so we have <coughs> a, uh, an example of a create machine uh, call. This creates a state machine in which you have a couple of states. You need to specify. Uh, specify the initial state, and you you can also have like transitions based on on events, and you can target other uh, other states. What is cool here uh, that through through the same concept, uh, I I can actually like strongly type all of those strings. So in here, I have derived A B C D, and it's all thanks to to this template, and we specify here that on uh, like uh, for the on, we have a re record of strings, and but the key of t, which again is just like constructed for us, really like TypeScript does all of the heavy lifting here. 
uh, key of t are acceptable at this, as this like value position, so basically in here. And what is also interesting here, that even though uh, t is constructed while like descending into states property, because that, that whole map type is here, it can also be used outside of it. So I can still like type initial state using this key of t, so I can still ref refer to, the, to whatever is in the states like from outside of it. And that also works, I can, I can just go through that. <clears throat> this example builds on top of the previous one, and this implements a recursive uh, reverse map type, which <laughs> is hard to say. Uh, but <clears throat> it turned, like, I couldn't figure out at first how to do that, but then it, uh, then it became like, apparent, because it turns out that it isn't actually like super over complicated beyond like previous example. This intersection is basically whatever, like the only the added, the, the only added part here. Because like <clears throat> at the very first example, we have seen that, uh, that for TK, we were inferring unknowns. So, uh, so like the, the basic thing that we get if we don't, if we want to use TK somewhere on the right side here, we will just get uh, we will just get unknowns at this position, uh, and we will only infer the keys. But if we pass that kind of like magic unknown that is just being figured out by TypeScript as he goes through your through whatever argument that you have given it, it will like put that unknown there, and then we can see that this state is actually referring to this very same definition here. So the whole type alias re is recursive here. So we pass it this unknown for the top level, like state thing, and then it sees again like a, a, new, a new state's property. So it just infers to that outer TK, the inner thing, and constructs it like recursively. So the end result is something like this. Like again, between the triangle brackets, we can see that it kind of recursively infer those unknowns. Like we still don't really produce anything useful at the value position of that, except if we have those states there, then the new object is created there with unknowns at its value positions and all. And it could just go, you know, indefinitely to infinite depth uh, under memory crashes or whatever. And, um, and yeah, we can verify here that, for example, this top level initial, it only accepts N A B, even though like nested state has nested plus, plus another nested uh, properties. And again, here we also have just nested and another nested. Even though at the top level we have like A, B. So everything is nicely like scoped at each level and it just relates to each other and plays in harmony. <clears throat> another example of that would be something that utilizes um, something that is going to be released in TypeScript 5.0. So it's like brand new, blazing fast, whatever. And uh, it's a const uh, type modifier, type variable modifier. Uh, it's basically something that allows us as, a outer, as outer types to, um, to put magically uh, as const here. It's kind of annoying for people to use to, to put it here. So this is a way for, for us to just like give a hint to TypeScript that it, for example, should infer this as another ID literal string instead of just a string. And we can verify that here, like it, it went through it like recursively and we have read onlys everywhere and literal strings and all. The cool part is that we can self-validate now, which, uh, which is also kind of crazy because we can see here that that we have this t, and we it 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 extends state config, but for some reason here, like we also depend on t here. So we have some kind of helpers. Like I won't be going there, but it, it get IDs basically just goes through the inferred object, like at the latter stage of inference, it just grabs those IDs from this const object and provides that as argument to kind of itself, because t depends on t here. It's like the point here is that you can, you can just do this kind of stuff and, uh, and you can learn from this. Uh, and it, it, it works, which kind of I was surprised by at first. Uh, so for example, here I have autocompletes and, uh, and it's all derived from, the, from that single object. 
Um, but we don't even have to use cons. This is kind of like a simplification, perhaps. But, uh, but uh, the basic rule of TypeScript, how to infer string literals, is that if the constraint is a primitive type. So as long as I type this, like, as long as if I like, add another type parameter here, TIDs, and I constrain it with a string, so with a primitive type, then it just behaves kind of differently from when like inferring object types and stuff. It actually like it hints TypeScript to infer literal strings. So whenever I will now use those TIDs, uh, that, that type variable, and again I can I can like recursively pass it through through layers, so it can appear at any position uh, in the input argument. TypeScript will just gather tho those literals everywhere and create a union out of those. So it's pretty simple actually. Uh, it's just a little bit different from like standard inference for for objects and stuff like that, uh, because with objects, if you would have like a string property there, it would actually stay as a string and not as a literal uh, string type. And um, I found a limitation here actually, uh, because this uh, this another ID here should be allowed. But it isn't because TypeScript only inferred like my ID and an empty string from somewhere. Um, <clears throat> okay, it inferred empty string from here because it assumed that uh, that it's like an inference candidate that is a possible source for this inference, which is annoying for me because I, in here, I only want to accept already like inferred IDs, but I, but I don't want to accept this particular ID here at this position as a valid ID, because valid IDs are always at like ID property, wherever in the object, but they are always at the ID property, not on the right side as the value. So I can fix it with like a magic trick, no infer, it's, I don't know, stack overflow stuff, I, I didn't figure it out. Uh, but you can block a thing from being inferred, and now it actually, it actually limits all of the, those inference places to what I want, so it only inferred my ID. The problem is it didn't actually infer another ID as a possible ID, and it should. So I got really annoyed by that, so I fixed it uh, in TypeScript. This is, uh, this is like a TS Playground running one of my PRs, and yeah, it's, uh, it's allowed. So unfortunately, one lesson here, you, like, there might be dragons, and not everything works as expected, but I'm working on improving some things. Um, and yeah, that's that's like one of my proposals to TypeScript, I, on which I think I will be working on in coming months, uh, to to allow people to um, to infer to um, to infer to like concrete properties, uh, because right now you can only infer to TK. You can't, for example, uh, infer to TK and to its like name property or whatever, like. TypeScript in a couple of places is a different, like weird rule, sort of, that it requires the type to be naked, they call it that. Uh, don't, yeah. um, so if only TK is naked, it isn't like combined with an access property or something like that, then it's the inference source. But I think in this regard, it doesn't actually make, like it's, it, it, it isn't like a strong limitation of the engine, it's only, uh, how it w it has been coded and no nobody explored beyond that in this particular example. Uh, so I think it would make sense to to improve this algorithm a little bit um, because, for example, it could it could be very helpful for for libraries like uh, TanStack Query. Right now, <laughs> they have something like that. Like you have a couple of like conditional types nested. Like I don't know. I, I would have to have a beer to read that and I'm not capable of that right now. It's very complicated, and it doesn't even deliver what they want in a couple of places. Uh, at least it, some places can't be like inferred because TypeScript itself is just being lost here, uh, so they have an open issue about that and all. But I think like all of this craziness could be simplified with something like that. So, um, so the, my proposal is basically to allow like concrete, uh, concrete access properties to also be inference candidates. Uh, so TypeScript, with my proposal implemented, could like even construct it from nested levels, and that would allow for things to be like 
piped from property to property to property because the input here is the query key, but then we have a query fn that depends on that key, and later on we have the output of that query fn uh, like served as the arguments to the select so they can uh, infer data. And I think all of that like nested conditional types could be very much simplified to just that, so I think that's pretty cool, at least like for library level uh, stuff. Uh, but yeah, that, that would actually like solve some, some of the inference problems there that they are facing with a much easier to comprehend type and stuff. I, I've been chatting with their maintainers and most of them are even ta afraid of touching this code, so, uh, so it tells something. And I hope you have enjoyed that ride. Okay, awesome. Thanks, thanks a lot. So I have a question. Uh, raise your hand. Who knew about map types before? Okay, we have few people. But see, uh, the rest learned a new thing from you. So thank you, thank you a lot. And um, we have a few questions. And uh, do you want to read the questions yourself? So because I think it will be easier. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so the first question is, Mateusz, why did you use declare prior to the class declaration? Uh, like, there's no particular reason, but it's less code, and the presentation wasn't actually like, like the runtime value of that thing didn't really matter, so it was only about the types. So it was just easier, like, uh, I was short on, uh, I was, yeah, like, I didn't have a lot of, like, real estate on the screen uh, with the zoom uh, bumped up and all, so it made sense to, to just skip the unnecessary bits. And the second question is, um, do you think satisfies operator could be improved to participate in the inference? I feel that people are often scared of adding new functions for types only. Mm, yeah, yeah, like, I think that part, that, that prompted the Ken C. Dodd's question, um, because like, I, he's, he has some nickname for like identity functions that produce other types and stuff like that. Um, but he wanted to avoid that, I presume. Uh, so he tried to use, to, to use the satisfies operator to, to like accomplish that goal. I don't know, like, like I think the, the most probably like intuitive way to do that would be to introduce some way of like specifying the inf infer keyword in the, within the satisfies and somehow doing the, uh, that there, this like reverse mapping. Uh, but infer, infer keyword already like appears in a couple of different places and it's kind of overused, I think. I, I don't know, like it's, it's a single keyword so it's easy to remember it, but it tends to mean a different thing in different positions. So I'm not sure if adding more on top of that is the best thing to do. Um, there are like a couple of TS proposals related to satisfies operators to like allow them at different position to like to allow satisfies itself at the different positions and also I think that we will see like new advancements in the field but like I'm not sure if if I if like any of those is actually about inference and if it will be possible it would be neat because yeah like I, I also believe like if if I could spare the identity function, uh, I would avoid it. Like, why would I add runtime code even if it's one line? Uh, but on the other hand, it doesn't matter. It's one line, so uh, so you know, do whatever works uh, for now. Uh, but yeah, it would be cool to to get access to new new type constructs to do to do stuff. But the good thing uh, about the the identity function approach is that's easy to use, so it, it doesn't look as scary at the call side, whereas like probably if you would have the satisfies operator at the call side where you would like to do it and with additional infer keywords somewhere there, it could scare a lot of people, I think. So one thing is to be able to, uh, to write this code, the other thing is for your team to use it, so I think it's, it's kind of, it's a, an added benefit of the identity function that you can 
hide the complexity there. Mm, yeah, so somebody said here that Kent calls them constrained identity function. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I couldn't remember. <laughs> it's constrained identity function. Yeah, cool name. Um, and the last question here, I think, uh, is unrelated, but I need some advice from my role model. Uh, please don't call me that. How do I get good enough to contribute to TypeScript? Uh, uh, I don't believe like I'm anything special in this regard. I'm just like bashing my head through through the code, and <clears throat> like fortunately, it, TypeScript itself is written in TypeScript, so like at some level I can understand that it's using a lot of um, perhaps like foreign um, names and stuff like that. But if you just keep going through it. Uh, you just start learning them, but at some level, it, it's just code. It's just working with objects and stuff like that, arrays. So, uh, so at some level, for at least like for 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 a class of bugs and stuff, it's it's often not that hard to to even contribute to code like this. Like for example, contributing something to the inference algorithms probably or like type checking is way more complicated than contributing to completions. Or to mm, to like some like code suggestions and stuff like that. that's often way easier. And you can, for example, start there. What helped me in this particular regard is um, is an awesome tool uh, that is called Replay, and it's a time travel debugger. Like I'm a fan. I'm a fanboy. They they should be paying me. Um, and <clears throat> it's an actual time travel debugger. So you can record a session. Of a browser or of, or of a Node run like the Node.js, and it records everything that happened there, and then you can open that in their app, which is just a web app, and it's pretty much like the standard debugger experience that you can get in Chrome, with the added benefit that you can step back because it is actually time travel de debugging. They record. They are recording like every math random call that you are doing, every new date. So every run of your program that they like replay later on uh, is is guaranteed to be the same. So that helps me because I can record like a type checking run for a simple thing uh, in TypeScript repo, and then I just like go through that replay recording and just step it, step through it, step through it. If I got too far. <laughs> I step back, and I don't lose context as with like as I do with the traditional debugging. Because if I would step like too far in a traditional debugger, I would have to restart everything. But there, I can put notes and stuff like that, and I can easily go back to it. So it's it's much easier to just build up mental model over even complicated code thanks to that. I believe. Thank you again. Oh yeah, I will take it. Okay, I just wanted to add more thing about this part uh, related to contributing to TypeScript. So if you are interested about how it works under the hood and like what's going on in the code base, uh, I highly recommend a presentation by Orta from Microsoft team. If you um, Google how compiler compiles, then you're gonna find his presentation is about 40 minutes and it's really, really good. And he goes over like all the steps, like what TypeScript does under the hood. So sorry for this off top and for this. <laughs> um, okay, thanks Mateusz again. And now we're gonna welcome on stage Adrian from Sailor. And let me remind you, Sailor is the company that made this meetup possible. Welcome Adrian.
Hello. Just give me a sec, because I apparently lost internet connection. I think we're good. So when Sebastian Markbitch, uh, core maintainer of React, wrote his library upgrade guide in the React working group repository, I don't think he was aware of the impact it will have on, on the discourse around CSS and JS libraries, especially that in the end it was just a set of instructions, set of tips to CSS and JS library authors in order to make the process of migrating those, those CSS and JS libraries to uh, React 18, I believe. And even though it was like one and a half year ago, uh, the discourse is still going. We had plenty of articles uh, with titles like, is CSS in JS dead? Or uh, why we are breaking up with CSS in JS? And obviously we can uh, have a bit of laugh about these because you can quickly see that uh, some of them were written on, yeah, without really going into the depths of what uh, Sebastian was uh, writing about. But there's surely some merit to what he spoke uh, in his article because uh, he uh, basically mm, described the context around uh, why these changes are needed in the first place and what is going on with the React team uh, attitude to our, towards CSS and JS libraries. And yeah, people got some quotes, uh, some, some yeah, really nice and strong looking quotes from his article. They jumped to conclusions, but it's still worth looking into. So I think this is uh, a really good spot to kind of take a step back from this whole situation, take a big wide look at CSS and JS in general, see where we are, uh, see if we can do something about these problems. Are they really CSS and JS problems? And uh, maybe there is something better than CSS in JS, who knows? So uh, yeah, I hope that by the end of this talk, I will at least make sure you are sold on CSS in JS, because I, I quite uh, like those kind of libraries uh, myself. I will try to distinguish different types of libraries in that space, and I will provide surface level overview of how they work so that you can go back to your regular uh, everyday life and at least have some uh, bit of a context around why these things works, work this way and uh, maybe even some more confidence in CSS and JS. So I'm Adrian Pilarczyk. I work as a devil at Sailor Commerce where we build world's best uh, e-commerce platform and surely we make the Poland's best TypeScript team. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Pilarenko, and you can also find me tinkering with my uh, personal website's code, not, not the content, obviously, uh, at PilarDev. So, yeah, okay, uh, first up, let's yeah, take uh, a little history lesson. So, we, at some point, were all in a place where this is our reality in terms of styling. So, you have your component, you have your application code, and you have a style sheet you, you hope is in the scope of your component or you just import it there, but that's basically it. In terms of connecting the component, connecting the classes you, you write, you are basically shooting in the dark. You can have the styles open right next to it. You can, have, you can have the CSS file right next to it, and you can basically copy paste the class name, but this gives you no confidence that this code will not break at some point. And this is especially kind of insane coming from the perspective I think we are all coming from, which is the perspective of type safety and having as much confidence as we can. So no wonder that a lot of effort has been put into making this whole experience better. And we definitely succeeded over the years. Uh, one of those, uh, those efforts were led by these two beautiful Australian gentlemen, Mark Dalbish, Glenn Modern. So uh, I think in 2014 they created CSS modules, which is not a CSS in JS library, but why I'm talking about it will become relevant in the next couple of slides. 
So basically what they did is that they mm, uh, provided this very tiny, mm, shaky, uh, but still a bridge between the styles and components. So you were able to import styles into your component and consume those styles by JavaScript import. Only this time you are not just importing it to the scope, we are importing an actual object with class names and those class names refer to the class names we wrote in our styles, so we have a bit of a more direct connection with what we wrote. Uh, one of the characteristics of CSS and JS is obviously the .module.css uh, prefix in the file extension, and then we write our static and scoped styles with it. This solution, uh, this characteristic is still very, very relevant, and basically CSS modules are still being used today. And what's even more cool about CSS modules is that they um, accomplished all of that without really modifying the delivery process of CSS to the browser too much from what we, for example, have with uh, preprocessors. So basically, you write your .module.css file, it goes through build, uh, out of the build we have a regular .css file, and then that CSS file is being delivered to the browser, and Please, people who actually work on these things, don't feel offended by this, uh, this slide, but what I'm saying here is that once the browser has the CSS file, it knows perfectly well what to do with it, and the, the process of, of reading and rendering those styles is pretty straightforward. And how it compares to CSS in JS libraries is this. You write your code with JavaScript, with your style functions, uh, CSS functions, whatever, but after the build finishes, you still have a JavaScript file, and that JavaScript file is being delivered to the browser. And here, what I'm saying is, is that this, this process that, is, that feels really natural for, for just that CSS file gets a new step, and in fact, set of steps. And uh, they all differ between one, one library and another, but fundamentally, they are pretty similar to each other. And uh, what is even more important is that all these steps happen in runtime. So you better hope this, this step is fast because it's gonna cost your users uh, time. So why are we doing it to ourselves? Why are we making our users wait? So there are plenty of good reasons to CSS in JS. I chose three. First of them being collocation. We, we all know it by now. But when it was introduced, it was a heresy. It was like breaking the holy separation of concerns, uh, which, which was unthinkable. But given that we moved from, from styling from the document perspective to more component perspective, it, it makes sense. And it once again proves that if developers can put something together, they eventually will. And uh, there's also this idea of dynamic styling, which is a really broad term I'm using for, for uh, all the all the possibilities that we get from the fact that the serialization of styles, the, the, the processing of styles happens in the browser, and this means that we don't need to know our styles before we render the page. We can do certain things dynamically, we can do it on interactions, we can go as far as fetch our theme from an API and then pass it to our uh, component and use it as a prop. So this opens a lot of doors. Mm, and uh, what is more important, and perhaps the most important thing, is the type safety, which wouldn't be possible without CSS in JS, or shall we call it CSS in TS for this slide. So basically it brings the very loose and uh, unsafe, <laughs> sometimes even unpleasant uh, experience of writing just regular styles in CSS into this, um, we can call it, Univite styling language that gives us a lot of different possibilities and uh, a lot of different tools to impose certain restrictions which come in handy when we are trying to express a complex design system. So we are saying like this rules, th these rules are all connected together, uh, you can't use any other token in your component and so on. So we can com in impose those restrictions in ways that we would basically have to, um, in ways that are much better than just regular .css uh, file, because there we would have to basically make sure that developers are doing the thing we, we agreed on, but here we can actually create those, um, those boundaries. And an example of that can be creating a type for our color, so let's say we agree on using HSL, because we want to do all sorts of different fancy things with those colors later on. 
And uh, yeah, we can create a style for uh, a type for it. And then once somebody tries to add something that doesn't fit that type, we get an error. So uh, like I said, there's some controversy about CSS and JS libraries, especially about its performance. This is quite a, a deep uh, topic, uh, so let's try to make it uh, quick. This is, these are, let's say, facts. So converting JS styles into regular CSS has a runtime cost because it's an operation that happens in runtime. And this is a, a scary sentence, uh, but the, um, the, the size of that cost, the actual value, will be different from one website to another. So it doesn't mean that using CSS and JS library will make your website slow, it depends. Um, also, browsers are already optimized for just that CSS file, and when we are using CSS and JS solutions, we are kind of opting out of this uh, like optimal path of delivering styles to our browser, and obviously CSS and JS libraries have their different optimizations as well, but yeah, it still feels a bit unnatural for the, for the browser. And uh, dynamic styling hides a lot of performance food guns. So uh, this comes back to the, the, the first point, which is um, a lot of, a big part of this runtime cost from, comes from the usage of those dynamic features of CSS and JS, or perhaps not necessarily right usage of those features, or ex just extensive usage of those features. So um, there is, plenty of things you can do wrong, basically, with CSS and JS, and this is the reason why we have best practices pages in the documentation of those uh, CSS and JS libraries. I mean, I hope we have. We have, we have them in some libraries, but not in all of them. That's a shame. But basically, you can do a lot of things wrong. You can abuse those dynamic properties because of CSS and JS library because they weren't meant to be used for everything. And once you start um, using those, those food guns on yourself, you have a lot of performance issues. So once you start uh, investigating those possible food guns, you, you may arrive at some rules of thumb for how you use CSS and JS. So for example, if you have a, a component that has uh, a, a prop that is basically has a, an infinite number of values, like an avatar that you can, uh, and each avatar will have a different background image, that's not a good fit for just passing as a prop because you will get duplicated styles and so on. So maybe you should rather use style attribute. This is an actual functional <laughs> attribute we can use. This is not just a gimmick or something. Uh, it actually has its, its uses and this is one of them. So using styles, style attribute for dynamic props then you can say to yourself, like, let's try to build components with no dependencies, uh, whatever that's possible. And what I mean by that is stick to writing styles that are static. They don't subscribe to d different things outside of their scope, to the theme, to other components, and so on. Uh, because this is what will make, uh, you will be sure that those styles will not change and will not cause some unnecessary renders and performance issues. Or you can say, each component can be extended only one level. So, for example, in styled components, you can pass a component to the styled function, an already existing component, and uh, then perhaps extend it even one more time and one more time, and this creates this entangled mess of performance issues, and it, it makes it really tough to debug what is causing these issues. So at this point, it would be safe to ask yourself how many layers of CSS and JS library can I peel off to not feel like I'm second guessing every choice I'm making with how I write my styles. But this is a pretty dramatic uh, look at this whole situation. And uh, another reason why CSS and JS get some slack lately is that it's quite complex, but now I mean like uh, build time complexity. So it's about the way CSS and JS libraries go in interactions with other libraries, and uh, they are mostly the critical libraries that you use, so your framework, your meta framework, uh, the scenario of you trying to upgrade your React on, or Next.js version and finding that, that it's impossible because it breaks uh, because of some problems with your CSS and JS solution is pretty common, and you can see it yourself on pretty much all the repositories of all the CSS and JS libraries, which is obviously tough for the maintainers because they're doing their best possible job to, to fix it, but there are so many permutations, so many different uh, 
tools CSS and JS have to uh, basically integrate with, it's really, really tough to keep up. So, um, as you can see, there are some drawbacks, surely there are some problems, but we also know why we are using CSS and JS for, for plenty of good reasons. I, I don't want to go back to writing just regular that CSS file. So, is this situation salvageable? Can, can it be better? Well, yes, for two reasons. First of all, um, saying that CSS and JS has a runtime cost is a really broad sentence. It can mean everything. On one website, it can mean that the actual user is suffering from some lags on some interactions. But for another website, it can mean that there is a slight delay with rendering the page and it doesn't really matter. And if you would try to fix it uh, and you would spend a, spend a lot of time on it, that would be like an over-optimization, not, not worth going for. So uh, if you are not aware of these best practices, you probably have some ways you can improve your situation with CS, CSS and JS, but that is in the case when if you are actually noticing any problems, because it's not like I'm here talking about it, and now you all get these problems. If you, if you didn't have them before this conversation, before this presentation, you are probably fine. And you can definitely have this impression that now you have these issues because, reason number two, there are some new shiny tools in the CSS and JS ecosystem. So yeah, there's no point in looking for solutions outside of CSS and JS. But what is good news is that CSS and JS, uh, most of the, the, the biggest, the most popular libraries, actually represent like a one subset of CSS and JS libraries, which we can call like inject styles, CSS in JS library or runtime CSS in JS libraries. And these are your most uh, popular ones. And you can also have extract styles, CSS and JS libraries or static extraction. And what is exactly different about these types of libraries? Because they basically just start to become more popular. So yeah, coming back to this uh, beautiful diagram, so once again, you're writing your styles with the way you prefer, so TypeScript, JavaScript, your style function, whatever. But after the build finishes, you end up with a .css file. And as we know, the browser is capable of uh, processing that correctly. So like, at this point, you can ask yourself, why wasn't this uh, possible in the past? Uh, but yeah, anyways, this, this whole... Um, group of libraries within the CSS and JS ecosystem consists of many different libraries, but I chose this one, Vanilla Extract, coming from the Australian Avengers, uh, Mark Dalglish, Matt Jones, Michael Taranto. Uh, I don't know what's with uh, Australians and making CSS solutions, but yeah, let's thank them for that. So, uh, and I also chose this Vanilla Extract for two more reasons. One, because it corresponds with some of the ideas I already breezed through in this presentation pretty well, those like historical ideas, and also we um, use it in production uh, at Sailor and we find it pretty uh, working pretty well for us, so we can definitely recommend it. So yeah, let's, um, let's have a look. First, consume styles in component by JS import. Looks, looks familiar. We have a prefix in our file extension, only this time it's .css.ts, and this time the TS is silent, so we can omit it, and basically we end up importing things from .css file, which kind of feels like trickery, but uh, it's, it's, it's correct, it's accurate, uh, because <laughs> you can say it's accurate because after the build finishes, you actually have a .css file, that you import in your component and you also import the uh, class names that you were referred to. So then you end up with writing static and scoped styles once again, but there's more because if there was nothing more, we would have basically CSS modules too. We have uh, some core CSS and JS features like creating theme, which basically is, is, is the same as any other creating theme uh, function. We also have type safety in consuming the theme as well as type safety in writing any styles. Just make notice of the fact that we are simply importing the variables from our theme, the tokens from our theme into the scope and that's it in terms of consuming it. And after the build finishes, we end up with CSS variables. So also like a native solution as well. And we also have some utilities, some functions for different popular problems in CSS and JS 
ecosystem so we can create variants. Those, this uh, style variants function can consume any objects. And in this case, I'm just passing an object of colors in our theme. So then we can create variants that have some shared base <laughs> style. And we can uh, also have the differ differentiating styles um, for each variant. And then we end up consuming it as an object with keys of, of those variant names. And also, we have to import the theme class, which uh, brings all these CSS variables to our scope. And what's uh, kind of cool uh, is that uh, Vanilla Extract is able to create those variants pretty in a pretty smart way. So we don't duplicate code for each variant. We just have a shared uh, base style. So the font size and the text decoration is one in one class. And then each individual color is in separate problems. Uh, in a form of small libraries, so for example, for dynamic features or for creating variants or for creating some atomic utility styles. So even though it's pretty young, it, it feels mature in that way. But if you don't like the, the API or, or maybe you have something against Australia, you can um, choose from any of the libraries in this, in this space, which, is, which has some big players like Microsoft with Griffel, Atlassian with Compiled, and Wrocław Skolstak with Linaria, which I believe is the oldest, the most mature out of these. And from what I've read, uh, Airbnb recently moved to Linaria, so that means something. So yeah, uh, a bit of a comparison and summary at the end. The runtime CSS in JS is good with dynamic features, although you have to be uh, careful with how you are using them. It allows collocation, which is a super powerful uh, feature. You write scoped, type-safe styles. Uh, you suffer in terms of performance and com complexity, but that will differ from one application to another. Like, how big is your code base? How are you using those dynamic features? And so on and so on. So this may not be an issue for you. And um, static extraction, dynamic, not so much. Although it has some, I mean, it can be dynamic, but the experience of writing those dynamic styles will not be as convenient as using, for example, styled components. In terms of collocation, it differs from one library to another. So vanilla extract doesn't allow it, but uh, in Aria does, for example, so it's possible. You write scoped, type safe, and performant styles, but in terms of complexity, nothing beats a .css file. So it definitely brings, brings some of the complexity. It's, it's similar in that area to just runtime libraries, libraries, and you can already see that in uh, GitHub issues and discussions because it's not free of, of some uh, bugs. But my hunch is that it will end up being a bit less complex in that area, we'll see. So yeah, um, the verdict. What is the verdict? Which option is better? No verdict. I, I don't have anything for you. Uh, I advise you to go into this areas case by case. Don't believe, don't trust hype, uh, because that's not going to, to help with evaluating tools. Also, don't, don't believe that you necessarily have these issues. Maybe you don't. Make up your own mind. And actually, this is not bad, because this proves that we are in a really good space in terms of CSS and JS libraries, because we, the offer is so rich and so mature, we can now choose different tools for different problems we have. So. Oh, this is cool. My takeaways for you, um, first, make an audit of your app if you are concerned about CSS and JS performance. Like I said, maybe you don't have anything to, to worry about. Uh, if you have some issues, then go into best practices, f try to apply everything you can. Uh, most likely you'll be safe. But if you still have some performance, or maybe you have some spare time, you want to experiment, uh, yeah, don't go back home and rewrite your, your blog or your, God forbid, work project in uh, Vanilla Extract. Uh, but if you have some free time, then you can definitely take a look at uh, static extraction libraries and Vanilla Extract. And also, one final takeaway, uh, all CSS in JS libraries deserve to be loved as much as any other library. So don't, like I said, don't believe in hype, don't... Uh, be too serious about it. Uh, make love that library horse. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you a lot. It's really good to see that we have so many options regarding the CSS. And I love that the answer to most of the questions is it depends. Like you always have to evaluate your own needs. So I have a quick question. So what do you use for CSS for Sailor dashboard? Uh, that's classified. Uh, no, I mean, uh, so this is uh, this is actually an area that is under improvement right now, and we are moving to uh, vanilla extract. You can actually in the notes, no, not this QR code, the one I, I showed you for a second. Uh, there's a link to the Canary branch where we implement uh, the new UI with vanilla extract. So yeah, it's not using vanilla extract right now, but it will. Okay. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Yes, uh, I will go through comments and questions. The extract pattern also has a great benefit of native browser caching. That's what I was saying with the, you are opting out of the native uh, browser optimizations. So the runtime CSS and JS libraries often have issues with, with breaking cache and uh, when you are using just CSS, it's much easier to, to cache. Would you know a CSS reverse compiler that takes an existing CSS and put it back in extra, extra clip API format? Hmm. No, I, I do not. Uh, so not, not sure I, what I can do here, but I can say in the same matter that you, when you have a look at different libraries in, in the static extraction ar uh, area, for example, uh, you, you can find some that basically have very similar API to some of the runtime libraries. So you may think, wow, I can just go and uh, ch change the imports to the static extraction one and everything will work. No, uh, I actually read an article about uh, refactoring one rather big code base and moving it from one very similar in API static extraction library, sorry, one runtime library to a static extraction library. And the author said it, it took like two months of uh, work every day. So even though the API can be similar, it's not so, uh, yeah, it ended up being quite complicated. But yeah, sorry to, to not have an answer for that. Do you have an opinion about ecstatic? Uh, no, I believe this is, this is I, I think I've heard about it, but I didn't really give it a, a proper look. So I will have to look it up. Uh, Tailwind gets me at the X collocation closer to Emotion CSS problem than Vanilla Extract. What are the reasons you prefer Vanilla Extract over Tailwind? Because this is a different class of solutions and I, I wanted to mention Tailwind, uh, but I, I didn't because I didn't, uh, yeah, I just had to remove something from the presentation. And my, my commentary about Tailwind is that it's uh, in itself, Tailwind doesn't really give you any uh, benefits in terms of type safety and uh, yeah, uh, the way you compose your styles, but uh, there is a, a bit of a movement around it. So you can find some uh, libraries, I think one is called TypeWind or something like that. So they basically provide you a way mm, for writing your Tailwind styles with type safety. You, yeah, you, you should look it up. Wouldn't an Australian CSS and JS library <laughs> render the styles upside down? Yes, I believe this is one of the issues uh, on the repository that's been going for some long time. Yeah, I don't know why they're not fixing it. Are you aware what's the status of CSS in JS and concurrent mode? So uh, the original post I showed you, uh, I don't think it definitely, <laughs> I don't think it referenced the, the concurrent mode, but it, it I think you can say it expressed the React uh, team's attitude towards CSS and JS runtime libraries. And it's far from, from what I understand, we are from, far from saying like, don't use runtime CSS and JS libraries because they will be uh, not supported in the next React version of something like that. Like you are safe here, but they uh, basically straight, in, in a straightforward way told that they prefer the static extraction libraries and they actually develop their own at Facebook, at Meta, sorry. Uh, and uh, I don't know if it's gonna be open source, but yeah, you can, they uh, even said in, in one of the uh, Twitter threads that um, all of the discourse that is happening around runtime CSS and JS libraries is based on some, 
yeah, basically false interpretations of what uh, Sebastian wrote, but that's fine because uh, you are still, uh, uh, you can say you are still meant to pay a cost for runtime CSS and JS libraries. So that's saying something. Uh, like I said, I, I don't want to end it on a negative note. I, I'm sure those libraries will be supported for many, many uh, years, and they are great libraries, and they become faster and faster, and they also adapt to changes in React, so you are safe here. What advantages CSS in JS has over Tailwind CSS or other utility-first frameworks? Well, the argument I hear, uh, hear a lot is that Tailwind actually gives you some design primi primitives, which is good, but when you are trying to implement something specific, you will find yourself sometimes being restricted by those, by those, uh, by some of the rules they uh, they bring in. And uh, once again, coming back to the type safety idea, so um, it's difficult to express something complex in terms of design system if you have no way of making sure that your styles are type safe. Uh, I'm a backend heavy full stack engineer and I can learn only one CSS solution. What would you recommend? Hmm. hmm. I wouldn't recommend vanilla extract. I think it's too abstract. Uh, I think it's too heavy on the API side. Uh, I, it's like a set of building blocks, like I said, for building something else, for, for maybe for library authors. Um, I, th <laughs> I think. Tailwind wouldn't be a bad option. I think you can go with Tailwind because it gives you, mm, you can quickly feel powerful with Tailwind. And I think if you want to have a UI that looks uh, decent quickly, then Tailwind is a, is a good option. Yeah, I think that's, that's it. Okay, thank you again. Uh, so we have a little surprise for you. It wasn't originally in the agenda, but we have one more lighting talk from Jakub Nander or Zeiste. You may know him as Zeiste, and I think I know what he's gonna talk about. And I'm like super excited about it. This little thing that he's working on currently. Sorry to spoil. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so welcome, Zeiste. Thank you. Thank you, Ola. Just, uh, I imagine that by now you're pretty tired and there's always one person at the, at the end, right? But I have good news for you. Uh, my talk won't be as interesting as the previous ones, but it will be short, very short. So, uh, five minutes. That was the, the idea. Uh, and I was thinking that just to relax atmosphere a little bit, I will just crack a joke, you know, just to be, uh, just to feel the audience. So that's the joke. Um, Schrodinger's got a cat walks into a bar, and it doesn't. Okay. <laughs> so maybe, maybe that wasn't a good joke. Uh, in the end. <laughs> uh, so currently I'm uh, learning programming, and there is a lot of stuff I don't understand. Uh, but I was thinking, I will share what I learned, and uh, you know, just start a discussion. Uh, op open, open a discussion and maybe ask you what do you think about my learnings and what I discovered? Uh, it's not perfect, but who knows, maybe you will find it interesting. So today I would like to talk about my ideal web server, you know? And this is a work in progress. I just made this presentation just, just a couple uh, hours ago. Uh, so my ideal server would be uh, declarative. It's not the case uh, today, right? When we write, we have to, for example, uh, initialize this object, which is like a hidden state. We have some like imperative methods that we have to use on this object. For example, I don't remember exactly how it express you do it, like express and then you have to add something or you invoke the get method on that. So there's hidden state and we don't operate on values and uh, we don't really know what the routing is. If we create something, we rather define it how it works and that's not ideal for me, for my <laughs> ideal server. So for example, yeah, that's the, I forgot I, I made this slide. Uh, that's, that, that's the example, right? On the top you see that uh, I have some object, a hidden state, and I have to imperatively add a route to it. But I would prefer to have a list of routes, right? Because list is just the built-in uh, data, data type uh, in JavaScript, and then uh, I have a list which is ordered, so I know which one is the first, which one is the second, and, and last, and so forth. So maybe there is some improvement here. 
Second thing, there's a lot of like exciting things happening right now uh, for the web. Uh, and one of them is web API. So we have like a fetch API, we have, we have URL pattern as well and, and many more uh, different standards. So I was thinking maybe let's use that uh, when we will, for building this ideal web server. So for example, in uh, Express, you have the signature for the uh, handler which takes the request and response in the, uh, you know, uh, as the, in the input of the, of the function, which is not ideal because, for example, when you want to return something, you have to invoke this like send uh, method, I think, on the response. And if you did a return before uh, doing that, something strange happens, so that's not ideal. And then on the, at the bottom, we have a fetch API, which is a very simple function. It takes request as input and it returns a response as output. So we can like reason about it more easily. It's the mental model is, is easier here. Okay, I would like my ideal web server to be uh, composable. So I would like to just take functions and compose those functions in the uh, mathematical uh, way and maybe create some exec execution pipelines. So here's an example. <clears throat> so again, I have a, I have a list of, of routes and I define uh, a path for route, and then I have some handlers like h1, h2, h3. So I can define this list. And then um, if we have a handler, it's very simple, but then we could do something before the handler, right? And after, uh, so something in the, like when, which happens when the request is coming in, and then when the response is coming back to, to the user. So I could compose that, right? So I could use, we use for, for that uh, middleware. So for example, I could have middleware M3, M2, M1, and I compose them uh, into a handler. But instead of writing it like that, I could maybe use an array because again, this is a built-in uh, data structure and I know that M3 should be first, M2 sh should be second and so forth. And for example, we can imagine that instead of like a, the scriptic names, we could validate something when it comes, and then we could maybe add some response headers when it goes back, maybe handle the, the course, etc. And we could define it as a very simple uh, type, a pipeline, right? Middlewares, uh, a list of middlewares, and at the end we have a handler. And then I was thinking, I really like Lisp. I was doing Clojure for a long time, uh, and I would like my uh, web server to be like homo iconic-ish, kind of which homo iconic is this idea that if you use, um, you can use the data structures from the uh, programming language to write the code and then uh, you can, uh, so you can treat code as data and data as, as code. So for example, uh, here we could define a function which adds something, but then because this is a list, we could also like do something on, uh, with that using the language itself, right? So the, this opens a lot of possibilities for metaprogramming. And in the case of my ideal web server, I could define a server one, right? I could have a free routes. And then for example, I would have another uh, handler, uh, sorry, another route uh, to add uh, error. And I could say, well, the server two, it's just server one plus the error at the end, right? So I'm using push, which is built in in JavaScript, or I could spread it like that then I could say, uh, maybe I have a predicate, like I don't want to have this uh, welcome route, and I could use filter, which is again built in. So I'm using the language, I'm using JavaScript to operate on those servers, and I can declinate uh, those servers uh, wh while programming to some extent. Uh, and then, I, I love TypeScript. Who loves TypeScript, by the way? Okay, maybe, maybe this is wrong meetup. <laughs> Uh, so the idea would be to uh, not to have translation, right? And we have types, so, which is awesome. So I created that. I, I, I called it a web server interface, WebC. And the idea is to have this like a very thin, very simple, uh, but maybe not easy. So there is this idea by creator of Clojure that uh, simple is not easy sometimes. Or there was also like, uh, I think Einstein said that the, uh, uh, what, what he said? <laughs> <laughs> that the uh, simpl simplicity is the ultimate, uh, like the goal of sophistica sophistication, something like that. Uh, yeah, and uh, 
Then I was thinking maybe we could uh, make it uh, compatible with this modern runtimes we have now. We have BAN, we have Dino, uh, we have uh, Cloudflare workers, we have Lagoon, which are very interesting uh, tools. And then there, there, were, there were solutions like that in the past. So for example, we had Rack for Rubies. I'm not sure if any Rubist here maybe? Not a single one, okay, the language is that. Any, any Python, Nistas, or? <laughs> Not a single one, okay. So, I oh know there is one. Uh, so I was thinking that maybe uh, we should take inspiration from those tools and so RAC or uh, WS, uh, SGI was like the inspiration for uh, WebC. Yeah, I mentioned those tools, so we have BAN, we have, uh, we have Dino, and I would like to give you a very short uh, demo. I'm not sure if I'm still on time, uh, just a quick one. So uh, let me know if you see my screen. Uh, so, let's create a server. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it didn't work, I'm not sure why, but I have a... I <laughs> the guts of... The guts of Dima are not with me, but let's, let's try again, let's try again. Uh, so let's uh, do um, Wrangler. Create or maybe what would be? Yeah, let's let's do that. So I will be generating a project called uh, Roslav, Roslov maybe. Uh, CF from a template, which is like a, uh, unable to access. I think the problem is that I don't have uh, internet access, so maybe I can quickly fix that. Uh, is it working? Let's, let's try again. Let's, let's forget about what happened. Yeah, it worked. Uh, before I, I go into the directory, let's just run it. Uh, it didn't work because I haven't installed the dependencies, so let's quickly fix that. Uh, almost there, yeah. And let's run it. It works. So let's open that. And we have it. Right? It displays uh, something. Hello, WebC. And now, the, the, the best part. Let's deploy it. <laughs> On my personal account. It doesn't work. I know why. Uh, Let me just fix the name, deploy it, uploading, upload it, and I think we have it. Let's open, I think you can open this as well. It's working. As you can see, I, very quickly I created a web server in TypeScript and I deployed it with a very bad connection and other problems along the way. So that's all I have for you today. If you're interested more about the project, come talk to me. Uh, and um, there's this thing, you know, programmers are not interested in money, but they are interested in stars on GitHub. So if you have a spur star, I would appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you a lot. Um, we still have a few minutes. Don't go, don't go. Come back. Yeah, you. Uh, we still have a few minutes till the pizza arrives. So we have three, not exactly questions, but comments. Uh, oh, we have a question. But I will start with the comments. Okay. So it wasn't Einstein, it was Leonardo da Vinci. <laughs> Um, Thank you. Another it. comment is with uh, your middlewares, M1, M2, M3, Tim yeah. Cook is already working on a lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I will let you to, uh, to answer. Uh, oh, yeah, there are new questions. You can see them here. And okay, yeah, thank I'll you, for the, you for the time uh, to, so it's like the very last minute. So how does uh, the output of from WebC look 
like for the deployment? Uh, what's returned from the, your server function? Uh, I'm not sure if I understand this, Jonathan. Uh, so the, the idea is that <laughs> <laughs> the idea is that that you have the fetch API, right? So uh, it, it's the standard that is becoming more and more popular. And in the fetch API, you have a function which takes request uh, and returns response. So wh wh whatever I'm doing before returning to the runtime, like to Ban or to Cloudflare or to Dino, uh, is just uh, manipulation of values, right? And once I manipulate, so when I apply middlewares to the handler, the output is still handler, right? Uh, so we can think uh, about, we can think of a web server as just a simple, simple function, which always takes request and always re return the response. And what we do in between, so for example, we can check what method the request was uh, invoked with, right? Was it a get, was it a post, and we can react accordingly, or which route, which path was uh, accessed. But the basic idea is that this is a, a very simple uh, function, request in, response out. And uh, that's, that's all to what is to it. Uh, how do you execute side effects after responding uh, to the client? Um, interesting. I don't know. <laughs> so, so the idea is that it's like a server. So if you're doing uh, a side effect, uh, it's a side effect, so it's not taken into account because the runtime is just, re you know, the, the output of the handler is the response and you're just repackaging it to, the, uh, to be an actual HTTP re response. So I know if you l console log something or it's, it's uh, it doesn't make, um, there's a lot of question coming in, so, sorry for, is it going to be linked to be link closure, to be link closures ring. Yeah, so one of the inspiration was closure ring as well. Uh, so the idea for the ring was that, you know, in closures, the idea is that we uh, use values uh, to create, so instead of like creating those objects or like hierarchies of objects, we just use values. Uh, and uh, this is the same here. So I wanted to like transfer, I, I, I just basically stole this idea from, from closures, from, from rings. Uh, side effect depends on the platform. Closure has a function for that. Okay, thanks Michal for clarifying. Uh, what else? Okay, I think there's some trolling here, but uh, I will just <laughs> disregard that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, thank you a lot, uh, and thank you, thanks to all the speakers, to Josh, to Mateusz, to Adrian, and to Jakub, who joined us last minute, requiring us to shift the whole agenda. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> it was a pleasure to have you. Uh, so the pizza will be in a few minutes. Uh, someone actually uh, went outside to get it, so uh, you can stick with us. Uh, we're very, very happy to uh, to have you here. And as I mentioned before, um, we highly encourage you to apply to be a speaker. So uh, if you have any questions about that, like let us know. Come to me or Carol or Piotr or Jakub, uh, the words of TypeScript organizers. So again, thanks a lot. It was amazing to have you. Thank you.